National Geographic Channel. And they all lived happily ever after. Night sweet. In an ordinary house, on an ordinary street, there lived a cat. There's my kitty. I'm so sweet. He had everything a kitty could want. Feed the gerbils, honey. Affection, food, shelter, and a family who thought he was the sweetest kitty in the whole wide world. This is only half the story. There is another side to this contented kitty, one his family knows nothing about. Like his ancestors, he has the heart of a hunter. Well fed and showered with affection, wildness still courses through his veins. He may look domesticated, but look again. This is a real-life Jekyll and Hyde. It is the paradox of the cat. There are more than a hundred million cats in the U.S. alone. What goes on in their secret world? In the next hour, you may learn more about cats than you ever wanted to know. It's 8 p.m. Do you know where your kitty is? Magnificent, elusive, and deadly. The cat family boasts 38 species of feline ferocity, including the diminutive wild cat. Since prehistoric times, these cats have wandered Africa and Europe. The presumed ancestor of our domestic cat, the wild cat might look like a tabby, but its canines and claws are as lethal as those of any tiger. In its eyes, there's a haunting familiarity. How did this ferocious feline jump the wild track and make its way to our milk bowls and our beds? Felis Catus set out on the rocky road to domestication more than 3,000 years ago. In ancient Egypt, this hunter extraordinaire kept rodents from the granaries. In return, he was worshipped as a symbol of life. But history would not always treat our feline friends so kindly. Believed to be the devil's companion, more than a few were burned at the stake for keeping the wrong company. Luckily, the cat would soon fall into grace once again, for his hunting skills proved invaluable on the open seas. Cats kept the rat in check. Near the end of the road, perhaps the most steadfast alliance was forged between the farmer and his beloved barn cat. Now, what you got there? You are a good cat. Ironically, the cat's very wildness was its ticket to domestication. There's extra milk for you tonight. Now, to complete the journey. 12, 13, 14, 15, ready or not, here I go! What lay ahead was one of the most complex relationships nature has ever known. The remarkable bond between human and cat. We 
were drawn to a creature we could never fully tame. Wow! Hey guys, look what I found! We would overlook their wildness and welcome them into our lives. When the dust of the eons finally settled, we found ourselves inexorably linked to the cat. This extraordinary creature had found a permanent place in our hearts and our homes. At last, the cat managed to dethrone the dog as the most popular pet in the Western world. In the U.S. alone, house cats have doubled in number in just 20 years. Come on, up. That's a good boy. Cat mania is sweeping the country. These are piddle pants for cats. The Chase lounges are a new add-on to our products that we're carrying. The Litter Maid electric self-cleaning litter box. We probably spend about eight grand a year. 10, 20, or $30,000 a year to just on one cat. Yeah. Throughout the world, cat shows pay homage to our feline companions in a fury of grooming, primping, and keen competition. Household cats bring one. Through the careful coupling of cats, humans have created nearly 50 breeds of domesticated felines. Though some might look to the untrained eye like mistakes of nature, each coupling is carefully planned to make a winner. But a cat needn't be a winner to be the object of affection. Well, it's Rush's third birthday. And of course, Newt had his first birthday fairly recently also. We have birthday cakes for us, so why shouldn't we have a birthday cake for our four-footed child? Shirley Mae Ross and her husband have taken feline adoration to new heights. They're uh, very much our family. I think food's coming. Well, yeah. hi, Newt. Hey, Rush, here's some food, food coming. Oh, boy. My <laughs> husband spoils the cats. Of course, I don't. Oh, and so he always out, has the you cats eating cat. with us yeah, at the table. Here. One more bite, but don't let it spoil you. It won't get the same thing tomorrow night. They like to have the food that we're eating. Okay, man, and they oftentimes will eat very peculiar things, so things think. that they would never eat if you would put it in their bowl. But if they're eating it at the table, then it has to be good. As you can see, our cats are very well fed. But well fed cats still do hunt. So we keep them inside. And our cats are never bored. We are a very musical family. We've even had a cat who played the piano. Very well, as a matter of fact. His name was Wally. These two cats are just a little young yet. They haven't quite learned. But we have a dog who plays the piano and sings both. You want to hear Gus play? OK, mm -hmm. Gus, you want to play the piano? Go play the piano. Oh, no, 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 we have to have two hands. Good boy, good boy. Now, are you ready to sing? <laughs> no barking. <laughs> Coming in, Rush? Yeah. Newt and Rush are with us yeah. most of the time. When I get into the tub, I give them an entire yeah, package of the treats that they like. Look what Mommy's got for you. And sometimes they get up and they yeah. look in at the bathtub, and sometimes they chase my toes. They have a good time. Shirley May loves her cats, but even she knows there can be too much of a good thing. When I was a child, there was a family down the street who had some cats, and they didn't have them altered. And there were kittens born all the time. I told you to put that down. Well, of course, I thought that was great because I love kittens. Super kitty! Hi, Rosie. There are more than 10,000 human babies born in this country each day, and more than twice that many kittens.
sheltered and well-fed, cat numbers can soar if reproduction goes unchecked. Cats are prolific. One female can have as many as 30 kittens a year. In just seven years, she and her offspring could produce over 300,000 kittens. Suddenly, sometimes those kittens would disappear. And nobody seemed to be able to tell me where the kittens went. It was a very sad thing. With such feline fertility, unwanted cats are a sad byproduct of our domestic bond. This scene may be an echo from the past. But the tragedy is still being played out today. Even now, hundreds of cats are abandoned each day in the U.S. alone. What's to become of a castaway? He is suddenly faced with the struggle to survive in an alien world. But the cat holds a wild card, a gift from his ancestors. He is one of the Earth's most adept hunters. Good news for the cat, but bad for the locals. There's one more predator on the prowl, and when push comes to shove, he's not a picky eater. Another key to the cat's success. In the face of adversity, the cat often has the advantage. Armed with sharp claws, he's not restricted to terra firma. The cat nearly always lands on his feet. This diminutive creature seems to defy the odds. With a flexible backbone like a cheetah, the cat can run up to 30 miles per hour. But at times, the best strategy is to seek shelter and wait, for the tables will soon turn for Felis Catus. <laughs> Night belongs to the cat. He is a creature designed for the nocturnal hunt. With night vision, whiskers to help navigate, a keen sense of smell, and ears tuned to signals that mere humans could never perceive. The faintest squeak, even from a distance, allows him to pinpoint his prey and launch his assault. Only the fortunate managed to escape this master predator. of which we could only dream. His uncanny sense of balance almost always ensures a safe landing. With persistence and precision, the cat gets his mouse. This is a creature designed to survive. He has landed in the most outlandish of places. 
and somehow managed to endure. Near the Antarctic, temperatures can plunge to 50 below. On a diet of seabirds and the occasional penguin carcass, the cats of Macquarie Island have persevered since they were dropped here by sealers over a century ago. Half a world away, the volcanic Galapagos Islands offer little water or prey to its immigrant cats. Though lean, the population persists. Abandoned cats are struggling to survive throughout the world. Even in the US, where there are an estimated 50 million. Here in Miami, Florida, thousands of forsaken felines have landed in the middle of a raging controversy. Though the dumping of pets is prohibited in Dade County parks, it's not uncommon to find colonies of up to 75 abandoned cats. What are the consequences of so many predators? Don Chinquina of the Tropical Audubon Society is concerned about the wildlife. You know, parks like these are so important to migrating birds, because when you think about it, these birds fly as far away as, as the Yucatan. They come across the Gulf of Mexico, and they're tired, they're hungry. They land in a small, confined place like this to, to replenish, and they're greeted by 50 to 100 cats. It's a recipe for disaster. Through no fault of their own, these felines have stirred a fiery debate. Kate Ruby is one of many volunteer feeders who have taken pity on these outcasts. She too knows there's no easy solution. A lot of people are really concerned about the impact that the homeless cats have on the small birds in the area. In an ideal world, we wouldn't have people dumping their pets and the cats wouldn't be outside and they wouldn't be impacting the wildlife. But in this cycle of human neglect, it's not just the wildlife that's in jeopardy. These cats are at the mercy of world-class hurricanes, aggression within the colony, and disease. It's really upsetting to me when someone dumps their pets here because this is absolutely no life for a cat. In the last three and a half months, we've had 39 new cats dumped here. With so many new arrivals, the population is exploding. Spaying and neutering is critical, but most of the strays have become so wild it's impossible to even approach them. Catching them is always a challenge. I would say close to the building, wouldn't you? Members of the cat network provide the traps, the ingenuity, and the sardines. I mean, I really hope we catch that calico. Still, there's no guarantee which cats will venture into the traps, if any at all. Only tomorrow will tell. The night's bounty has been good. Kate? Is this the orange you were looking for? Yes, it is. I'm concerned that he's really sick. Yeah. Looks like he's going to have AIDS with all of those marks. Off to the vet you go. Dr. Ted Sanchez works with the Cat Network at a reduced rate caring for homeless cats. The rest of the funds come from volunteers like Cindy Hewitt, who contribute thousands of dollars each year. Okay. We're going to be taking a little blood test, and we're just going to try to rule out a couple of viral diseases that they commonly get. It's a male, and these guys tend to be a little bit more prevalent in the males than in the females because they tend to have more sexual contact. We're just going to take a little blood. Cats are vulnerable to two lethal viruses. Feline leukemia and feline sure. AIDS are both highly contagious and deadly. It's not a pretty death. Cindy, I think we may have a positive here. You can tell here. Um, we'll see what the test comes out, but you see the gums. They're real, real red. He's got a pretty good gingivitis here, which is one of the common things we see with feline leukemia or FIV, plus the fact that he's a male. Um, so we'll wait. He's got a couple of variety of skin lesions as well, so he's not in the greatest shape. He's been eating well. He's not too thin, but uh, this is a bad sign. It really makes me sad that the animals suffer. And any time I have to put a cat down, it really bothers me. 
Sure. But if you leave him, then he's going to infect the others. Sure, it's the right thing to do, unfortunately. And he'll also have a really miserable death. If they go through the course of this illness, it's not fair to them. They suffer too much. Cats that test negative for disease might be candidates for adoption, but first they must be spayed or neutered. I don't think it's the solution to the problem, but at least we are controlling the population somewhat. Thousands of cats are being put to sleep every year needlessly because owners are just not complying with spaying and neutering. We have to tell these people that are abandoning cats, this isn't the way to do it. Spayed and neutered cats have the tips of their ears clipped to serve as a permanent record. This kitten has become too wild for adoption. Once she's recovered from surgery, she'll return to the colony to face an uncertain future. You doing all right? All right. It's a dismal solution for the cats and a precarious one for the wildlife. I'm so afraid. Well fed and spayed, a cat can still hunt. But where are the thousands of homeless felines to go? Until an answer can be found, migrating birds may come face to face with yet another predator. But it's not just the homeless that hunt. There are more than 60 million house cats in the US and many are on the prowl night and day. What is the impact of these unleashed predators? The answer is clear at the Wildlife Center of Virginia. Dr. Gens, cat attack coming in from Harrisonburg. Many of the patients are casualties of ordinary house cats. They have two injured bunnies. Most are mangled beyond repair. Cat attack coming in from Stanton. Switch it, please. Each day brings new drama for Dr. Ned Gentz and his team as they try to piece together the victims of cat attacks. Well, I think this one's gonna make it. Although, probably half don't. Casualties pour into the wildlife center night and day. Pet owners are often shocked to find that their well-fed cats are killers. Though some have been declawed, the attack is often just as gruesome. This one was injured on its eye right here, and it was bleeding this morning really bad. And this one was injured on its right leg there. Oh, you better put it back in. The hospital recovery room is filled with creatures that fell prey to the claw. Most require intensive care. But for every recovering patient, there are four others that didn't make it. This represents two weeks of cat attack victims brought here to the Wildlife Center of Virginia, the non-survivors. We probably have an equal number of animals in the intensive care unit still being treated now that we hope will do better than these, but uh, statistically about 80% of the cat attack victims that we see here don't survive. Cats are incredibly efficient hunters and predators. This poor bunny was effectively disemboweled by the cat that caught it. Creatures lucky enough to survive an attack face yet another peril. Cat saliva is almost toxic by itself. Getting bit by a cat is like injecting poison into a wild animal. A wild animal with a cat bite that doesn't die from the trauma will die of an infection within 24 to 48 hours. As a wildlife veterinarian, it's my job to take care of sick and injured wildlife, and I like to do that. But this is a waste. These animals didn't have to die. If people would keep their pet cats indoors, these animals wouldn't end up in my wildlife hospital. What's a cat owner to do? Just three hours from the Wildlife Center of Virginia, on 25 acres of rolling woodland, lives a cat named Ting Tang Tu. Ironically, he lives with a biologist whose specialty is birds. As a devoted cat owner, Ruth Beck has been grappling with a personal dilemma. 
I uh, specialize in ornithology and I'm very interested in birds, but I also love cats. Ting Tang Tu is a hunter. It is not the cat's fault, it's what he does and what he does successfully. He has some basic equipment, just as every hunter would have. First of all, you can look at these nice teeth. And then we have an excellent set of switch blades, and they indeed can inflict quite a wound. Tips on, come on. Ting Tang Tu is a well-fed cat, but breakfast never puts a damper on his favorite pastime. He's an avid bird watcher and hunter. Each morning, after a full can of food, Ting Tang is ready for his favorite sport. But he has to comply with the rules of the house. Most bird species feed early in the morning. So just by not letting him out until 10 or 11 o'clock and for just a few hours mid-afternoon, when the birds are less active, will certainly help to prevent the cat from capturing the birds. Ruth has found a compromise that gives the cat some freedom, but gives the birds some protection as well. Ting Tang too must make the most of his hours in feline paradise. He is a cat with a curfew. When day is done, he'll be called indoors. I think that true cat lovers don't see their pets as killers. I'd like to see us make everyone aware of the fact that our pets are also predators. If we come to terms with the fact that our cats do hunt, the question then becomes, how much are they hunting? Look at this. That's just what the British well. Mammal Society yeah. set out to discover when they launched their survey called Look What the Cat Brought In. Just bits, a bit ghoulish, really. This is brilliant. Yeah, it's good, brilliant. isn't it? Excellent. Some of them are a bit worrying. There's a swallow on here, which is uh, just a bit concerned. The society has found itself buried beneath a mountain of responses. For Michael Woods, processing the results has been daunting. Come on, I can't have you sitting on top of all my work. No. Well, I have a very ambivalent relationship with cats. I love the way that they move, and I think they, you know, they're beautiful animals. But I just hate what they do to the wildlife. The society invited the public to register their cats for a five-month period, detailing every creature their kitty dragged home. The amazing thing is that we've had results from 750 cats, which is a, a huge amount, and much better than we'd expected. We've got a lot of them analysed, and it's giving us some really good answers. And some of them are real big killers. There's some big killer cats out there, and they're causing quite a lot of mayhem. Remarkably, and almost as you'd expect, the traditional prey of the cat, the mouse, has come out much the highest. Uh, if you extrapolate up to the number of cats we have in Britain, which is around about 7 million, and that's just the tame ones, the uh, wild ones are on top of that, then we're looking at something around 200,000 mice are killed every year by cats. And then we have voles, and then after that, shrews. The mice are interesting because a lot of people think we don't need mice, you know, because they can be a, a pest and a problem, and particularly if they get into the house. But mice are very important, along with the other small mammals, as, as prey species for our natural predators. Then if we turn to the information we've got about cats, we find that a third of them, approximately, wear bells. Wearing bells seems to make almost no difference at all to the amount of prey that they catch. They still go out and catch just as much. And colour of cats seems to make a difference. White cats appear to catch a lot less than some of the other more camouflaged cats, and I guess it's colour that does that, particularly at night, if they're hunting at night. The survey's certainly shown that however much you feed a cat, it makes no difference at all, and the cat feeds, and it's just as likely to start hunting immediately. Out of 750 cats, one of the biggest killers is Missy, a female cat who lives down in Dorset and who has killed over seven pages worth of small mammals and birds uh, for us to include in the survey. So she is a real you know, wicked thing to have out there. Knowing her record, I thought it would be interesting to, to enter her. And I was really surprised myself when I started to fill in the form and found out how many things she did bring in. 
Hillary and Jim Pike have become accustomed to Missy's daily offerings. For Jim, the rabbits are the worst. They always start from the skull and eat the head first. And all we get left are two ears and four little paws. And a tail. And a tail. Don't and everything like else is eaten. All. Which is not a very nice thing when you come home and it's on the middle of the mat or stuck on the tiles. There must be some sort of driving force that makes her do it all the time. Nothing to do with hunger, but they obviously just do it because they love it. The spot you see along here, she lays in there in the summertime and the swallows zip along, come down to along the top of the pond to drink, and she just leaps up and grabs them clean out of the air. And, you know, just a big snatch, and they just stun them, and then she's got them. The, the two sucker fish that we bought yeah. specifically to take out all the algae, within two weeks of us buying them, and they were quite expensive. Yeah. We paid £40 yeah. pound for the pair, they and were... in two weeks they are on the kitchen mat. Both, no, they were, we found them on the grass. Yeah. So uh, that was a waste of time. Never mind. Well, I've been collecting what Missy's brought in for the last two weeks, approximately. So, would you like me to show you just a few of the items? Or bodies, I should say. Mm. There's a little bird, I'm afraid. Just looks as if he's asleep, but unfortunately, there's one gone. And then this is one of the many mice we have around here. I don't know if you're into gruesome bodies, but... What can I sometimes find something like this when I come home from work? <laughs> well, what was it? Um, I'm not quite sure. I think probably a mouse. This is what Missy's bought in in less than two weeks. So she's quite a hunter. She's really surprised us on the amount of um, carnage. I've got to say that it's really shocked me when we started counting them up. In the last two weeks, she's brought in maybe 30, 36 items, plus maybe another dozen or so that we've let go. And I think that's a little bit too much, really. I'm quite proud to think that she was one of the, the top cats, but knowing how much stuff I didn't write down because I wasn't here to see it, um, I think she was actually the top cat. For many a cat, such extraordinary hunting prowess at one time translated into a ticket to travel the world. They kept stowaway rats at bay and provided welcome company on the open sea. But not all the cats that left port made the long journey home. Some jumped ship and soon had a foothold in a new frontier. New Zealand is a unique place. Like many islands, its wildlife evolved with few natural predators. Today, rare shorebirds still lay their eggs on the sandy beaches, completely exposed. Attentive parents tend to their chicks, but their nests are vulnerable. Until recently, the system worked fine. But today, New Zealand's shorebirds are in trouble. Here at Mungify Wildlife Refuge, the ferry turn is down to less than six breeding pairs. Each chick represents the future of the species. With the Department of Conservation, Richard Parrish and Lee Honor are part of a team trying to save the last of the fairy terns and Mungify's other threatened species. Five years ago, they found themselves confronted with a mystery. Something was killing the chicks, and no one knew what. The team had to do a little undercover work. One year we lost a lot of nests of the fairy terns and 
we didn't know who was doing it, so we decided to set up an infrared camera uh, 24 hours a day on, on the nest and try and work out who was taking the eggs and the chicks. The new lens is good, isn't it? The wide-angle lens. Oh, it is. Yeah, taking much better. Taking a yeah, much bigger field of view. Well, those chicks will probably stay there another day. Do you think so? And initially, we set it up on the Caspian Turn colony just to get used to the equipment and iron out the problems. What they discovered was both alarming and macabre. We ended up catching a cat on film, and over four nights, that cat took out 40 chicks. The interesting thing for me was that the cat only ate the heads. They left the bodies behind. Over the next four years, they trained the camera on various nests and found more gruesome evidence against the alien predator. As a result, feral cats are now being eradicated in Mongafai Park. New Zealand is just one example of what can happen when a cat comes to stay. Here, in a land where temperatures can soar to 120 and there's often no water in sight, it's hard to imagine any creature surviving for long. But the cat has adapted once again. In the middle of Australia's outback, it must eat whatever it can find, be it roadkill or Australia's endangered wildlife. Bilbies, bandicoots, and other rare marsupials have been pushed to the edge of extinction by a barrage of pressures, including introduced species. One of the culprits is the cat. For at least a century, feral cats have roamed this harsh land, and yet they remain a mystery. In an effort to understand their secret world, biologist Rachel Paltridge has enlisted the help of experts. Searching for a cat in the outback is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Yet these aboriginal trackers are able to read even the most elusive signs in the shadows of the sand. So they put a cat in sitting down there. Yeah. Him jumping here. Jump there. Jump there. Jump there and yeah. up there. He's caught him that mouse. Yeah. 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 With their extraordinary expertise, Rachel has begun to unravel the secrets of the cat. Where that pussy cat now? Might be a long way or? Must be a long way, right? That's good. With greater insight, she hopes that someday cat numbers will be controlled. They're a pretty amazing animal. You have to respect them, but they just don't belong out here. They didn't evolve out here. The native animals didn't evolve with them and just can't really tolerate their predation. Hopefully this work will lead to a better understanding of feral cats and eventually lead to better management. To reveal the patterns of these elusive predators, Rachel uses radio telemetry, tracking individual cats over time. Finding them is only half the challenge. <laughs> Feral cats are as ferocious as any wild animal. Before handling one, Rachel must first anesthetize it. Cat bites are not only dangerous to prey, they can infect humans as well. We caught this cat about four months ago using the Aboriginal trackers to, to catch it and radio collared it and we've been following its movement patterns in those last four months. This cat normally only roams over about two or three kilometres a day and he has a fairly tight home range that he lives in. He's lost about 300 grams in the last four months. I don't know if it's maybe times are getting a bit tough. There might be a bit less food around. I just wanted to check that his collar was still OK, not rubbing on his neck and just check his general condition. But he's fine, so we'll just let him go here and continue tracking him. Any cats that are not part of Rachel's study might find another fate awaits them. It is a twist of irony 
The cat has helped push much of the Aborigines traditional prey to near extinction. In doing so, it now fills an important niche itself. Like a game of cat and mouse, in this scenario, it is the cat that has become the mouse. one up for supper tonight? Mm. Well, we got to cook meat. Yeah, good meat. These people have been eating cats yeah. all their lives and um, well, well, it's quite an important part of their diet. Yeah. So they'll probably cook it up on the fire tonight. Good, good, good bush meat. meat. Yeah. Now that the bilbies, bandicoots and other medium-sized mammals have all but disappeared, the cat has taken a place in the food chain. Back at camp, Rachel collects as much information as possible before the cat becomes dinner for the trackers. Yeah. Do you reckon he's got much in his guts? Mm. I'm, I'm trying to look at the predation pressure on the, all the wildlife out there in the Spinifex grasslands, and um, looking at gut contents is probably the best way of understanding what they eat. This cat was obviously a very good hunter. Is that witchy? Yeah. But you can just see quite plainly that um, each object's quite intact Two still. <laughs> you are. Well, this one's snake. It's got a little snake in here. <laughs> oh, no. Well, there's heaps in this stomach. There's three different sorts of lizards, three of these military dragons, one quite large Agurnia skink and a smaller Pantherina skink, and there's also some remains of some bird feathers. So. You can just see how much of an impact they're probably having on the native wildlife out there if just each cat eats that much in one day. Ideally we'd like to get rid of them all together and see the native animals that have declined severely return to their original status out here. Until the cat is better understood, it will remain a fixture in the outback. It has worked its way into the food chain, for better or for worse. There is a new order here in the heart of Australia, and it's not a kind one for the wildlife or the cat. The cat wars are raging throughout Australia. Halfway across the continent, there's a new chapter unfolding. On 160,000 acres of land, a wire fence stretches as far as the eye can see. Why would anyone put up a 150-mile fence in the middle of the Australian outback? The world has lost 40 species of mammal over the last 200 years. 23 of those were Australian. At present, about one a year we're losing, and that's just not acceptable. John Walmsley is a self-made millionaire and rabid conservationist. Considered controversial by many, his passion for native wildlife has fueled his ire against the cat. Well, let's talk about cats. This is a feral cat and this is, they came to Australia about 500 years ago, probably with the early shipwrecks off the Western Australian coast, but they couldn't cross Australia until the rabbit came. The rabbit came late 1800s and that allowed the cat to cross Australia and that's when the devastation started. I love Australia and I love the Australian wildlife. I've taken on the job of saving them and I am going to save them. It's as simple as that. For over a decade, Walmsley has bred endangered species in captivity to ensure that Australia's unique creatures don't slip away. We were an island, we had no serious predators, and all these incredible creatures evolved like little, well, our marsupials, most of them, and they evolved to do wonderful things. We've got banded anteaters with fluffy tails. We've got kangaroos that burrow in the ground like rabbits, and we're losing them. We've got the bilby that looks just like a cartoon character. 
the world would love to see our animals, but they can't because they're all going. Wamsley's dream to create a safe haven for native creatures is getting closer all the time. But fencing in habitat is only half the battle. Before endangered wildlife can be released, the enclosure will have to be free of introduced species. This fence is all about cats and rabbits. It, it puts a pretty big boot in it. It's a massive charge and it's like getting hit in the middle of the back with a sledgehammer. When a cat touches that fence once, it doesn't come back. On the other hand, we don't want to stop the big kangaroos, the wildlife that already live here. We don't want to stop them with this fence. So this fence is designed to let them through. The kangaroos need to use just hop through. What we're going to do here is we're now watering the cats. The cats now have plenty of water here. And on the hottest day in summer, when we get there in February, when all the rabbits are gone, we're going to cut off their water. There'll be water outside the fence. They'll come over the fence to get the water. They won't be able to get back in again. For the cats and rabbits that don't take the bait, Wamsley called in an expert. Well, I guess Adam O'Neill is the real-life crocodile Dundee. He understands animals and the bush better than anybody else I've ever met. He's probably the best shot that I've ever seen. He can knock over a rabbit at 500 metres without any trouble. Yeah, he's got the job of getting rid of the, the cats and the rabbits. the cat along with every other animal on this planet they're not exactly calculating and malicious with the intent they're just uh, out there acting on their instincts to survive it's just unfortunate the way things have panned out I suppose but uh, they've obviously got to go from this environment once again the cat has been caught in the crossfire if you walk down the street with this cat hat on, then you are noticed, I can guarantee you that. Some people might try and ignore you, and they'll have different things to say to you, but you'll be noticed by everyone. Here at Cats Incorporated, we say no dead cats for hats. Right, Nippy? Not everyone approves of Wamsley's approach. Mom, touch on. At the other end of the spectrum is Christine Pearson, the president of Cats Incorporated. She is dedicated to the care of strays and the control of cat numbers through sterilization. Killing cats or trying to get rid of the cats is achieving nothing. Come on, kitty, 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 kitties. Christine Pearson has her own theories about the cat crisis. If you leave the birds and the animals alone, they have a natural balance between them. But the trouble is that people come along and they upset the natural balance and they stuff everything up. And so the cat wars continue to rage. Where does the solution lie? Perhaps it begins in our own backyards. In the Adelaide Hills, there is a cat whose lifestyle changed a few years back. Owner Christine Collier is a bird lover who's found an unusual solution for her beloved cat. Doodles is a happy cat. The more comfortable she is, the happier she is. The further out that tongue will hang. <laughs> she is the most beautiful cat in the world. <laughs> we just don't think that there's another one like her. Nestled in this Garden of Eden, Diddles has the run of the house and access to an open cat flap 24 hours a day. The world outside for Diddles is a labyrinth of bridges and tunnels, a playground for cats. We have what we call the London Bridge, where, which Diddles just loves to run from one side to the other, up and over and down. It's not a cage, and that's the beauty of it. The garden is full of birds, be it the hooded pigeons, 
the red finches, rosellas, the cockatoos that fly in. They will graze directly around the cat units. It's lovely to see the birds coming around so close. It certainly is peace of mind for me to know where Diddles is, that she is safe and she can go outside and enjoy life just as normal, but she's protected. And so are the birds. Back in Virginia, another cat is yielding to domestication. Ting Tang, time to come in. Ting Tang 2's moment in the sun has come to an end. You know the rules, come on in now. It's curfew time. Good boy. Oh, yes, let's, it's time to come on in. Until tomorrow, there will be one less cat on the prowl. Through the millennia, cats have found their way into our hearts and our homes. Mama, look what I found. Can I keep him? Please, please. But has our passion for these creatures also blinded us to their natural instincts? Has domestication gone awry? With cat numbers on the rise, Felis Catus is getting away with murder. Well-fed and sheltered, these predators are gaining a competitive edge against which few creatures can contend. Most simply can't compete with the extraordinary cat. In the time it's taken to watch this film, Cats in the U.S. have caught as many as 100,000 mammals and over 30,000 birds. As for Missy, last month she caught five rabbits, 17 shrews, 11 mice, and seven birds. Nine more cats were dumped in the Miami park. Newt celebrated another birthday. Diddles communed with the cockatoos. And Ting Tang, too, broke his curfew twice. It's 9 p.m. Do you know where your kitty is? Thank you.